Right. So, uh, greetings to you and uh, welcome to my latest webinar. And I just realized the other day that uh, I'm entering now, this is my uh, fourth year of doing monthly webinars, which I think is pretty cool. And it's a nice way for me to tell you about what I'm up to. Uh, also kind of hone my own thinking as I move forward with my own matrix work. And I would encourage you to give it a shot at some point. Uh, and we do a lot of that kind of stuff in the uh, mastermind and the act matrix certification program. We help people get set up for stuff just like I'm doing. And uh, Kevin Polk and I have been working uh, pretty hard at helping people get certified. And uh, quite a few of you folks have come through and I would encourage anybody that has a thought about uh, presenting or training or coaching with the act matrix uh, to uh, look into it and to talk to either Kevin or myself. Uh, since we're both doing the trainings now and we're both available to uh, answer any questions you might have about that. But for myself, this is my monthly webinar and uh, over the years, the matrix has really grown and it's being used in schools, and businesses, organizations and classrooms are using it to flex up their students and improve communication and businesses are using it to tackle productivity, uh, build more effective teams resolve conflicts, uh, and we are aware that there are sports teams out there using the matrix. Uh, I know of a few uh, high school teams that use it with their uh, coaches are using it with their students. And Kevin has worked with uh, several professional uh, sports teams about um, using the matrix. And we recently had uh, a baseball person on uh, not too long ago on the podcast, uh, The Art of Being the Act Matrix. And uh, so it's really nice to see it taking off and going into all kinds of different directions. Um, and, you know, obviously the traditional clinical and counseling and educational settings are using it really to address a wide variety of mental health issues, social emotional learning, addiction, chronic pain. There seems to be no end of application. So uh, lately, Kevin Polk, who is the creator of the Act Matrix, and I have been talking about flow and how it applies to different areas of, of your life. Uh, and uh, Kevin has really been applying it recently to tennis, and <coughs> he's getting back into tennis, <coughs> excuse me, getting his game going. And I have been really applying it all, all along uh, in my many years of uh, Aikido training. Uh, so an Aikido, for those of you who don't know, it's a really a martial art that's practiced as a means of promoting uh, peaceful resolution to problem situations. And you train in a dojo with others and your partners, and you're really, you know, we're working cooperatively uh, and, you know, we're doing it to, you know, harmonizing movements and learning how to flow toward the, the path to peace and showing people the path to peace. Now, both tennis and Aikido are physical activities, uh, but the concept of flow has many applications and it really started uh, in non-physical kinds of applications, uh, but it does apply to just about any area of your life that you uh, have significant investment in. Uh, so what I wanna do today is look at what flow is and how you can tap into flow states, not just on the mat or on the tennis court, but pretty much anywhere. So I'm gonna bring up my slides now and start sharing my screen. And let me just get to my slides now. So let's see, let me get them up there. All right, so you should be seeing my slides right now. Let me just make sure I got them up so you can actually see them. Okay, hoping that's showing up on the screen. And uh, you can still see me. And so, um, you know, this is really about looking at where did my flow go? And that's why I want to title this is that, you know, we want to be in a state of flow, but very often we find that it's more of a drip and less of a flow. So uh, to begin, I would like to start with my first exposure to the concept of flow, which was way, way back in my undergraduate college years uh, when I took uh, an Eastern philosophy course. And one of the subjects that we, uh, one of the philosophies that we investigated and studied was the philosophy of Taoism, uh, or what is really simply called the way. And, you know, Taoists looked at the natural world 
at the time, uh, where nature's where nature and animals were always in what they thought was they looked at as a state of flow. Uh, so you they looked around, they observed with their five senses, and what did they see? Well, you know, what they saw was you know the wind blows, the bamboo bends, and then it returns to its original shape. It yields. It, it, it doesn't resist. It yields. Uh, animals uh, quickly go from moments of stillness and where they're just kind of lying around mm -hmm. to maybe attacking to get food or fleeing to escape becoming food mm -hmm. uh, or resting then afterwards. And this is all done uh, in a very natural, relaxed kind of state. Where and then once that situation is passed, they're back into that natural state. And this is all done really with, within action, within moving. Uh, and it's like water uh, and you know, things just go their own way. That's what the Tao observes. Things just take their own shape or their own form and they go their own way. So the idea of resistance really just was not something that they were into. So they talked about you know non-resistance and yielding, just like water. And the, the, the uh, you know, that water metaphor has carried all the way through to this day. You know, the flow of water is constant. And yet in its form, it's very soft and it's very yielding. It doesn't resist. It just flows. It goes around things. And that really is its natural state. So now we can fast forward to today. And now in contrast, uh, the way we live in our, our lives today, and you can quickly see uh, that we humans in these times, our ability to stay in flow is really often reduced to a trickle. There's a lot going on. We are bombarded with messages from within and without, which has the effect really of drowning out the natural flow, that natural Taoist flow that they noticed all those many years ago. And then there is a cost, as we all know, and the cost is really in terms of the time spent, you know, what I would call pushing the river and with the river and going with the flow. Uh, we like to push the river, you know, we even put dams up all over the place and the diversions. So we're trying to push back against the natural flow of things very often. And we push back the natural flow of things in many sorts of ways by for perhaps staying up too late. Uh, or, you know, doing too much of this or maybe not enough of that. So we're constantly kind of bending ourselves in, into and then out of shape. Uh, and then over time, it gets harder to get back into that natural flow kind of a state, which is where we all began, uh, it, you know, just to start out with. So, um, you know, we could all use a way, I think, to allow ourselves to return to this flow state. And it just so happens, in my opinion, that the matrix is really a great tool for getting you moving in ways that work. So uh, let me go on because the other thing I wanted to now talk about is speaking of modern day, uh, there is this uh, psychologist who's been around for a long time and his name is, uh, I'm gonna probably butcher this, so stay with me, Mahai Shizemekhai. I think I did that. He is a Hungarian born and he's a psychologist and he has been studying flow states for decades. I think basically since the early seventies and um, you might be more familiar with that example flow state. Well, guess what? It comes from Mahai. He's the guy that started it and he started doing the research on it and his research. Uh, and you know, there's a little quote there, which I like. And he talked about the flow state is being completely involved in an activity for the sake of the activity. And then the ego or whatever, you know, that ego stuff, whatever that uh, who I am and what I'm all about and all that kind of stuff starts to just drop away when you're in that state. And time starts to just not really be much of an issue. You become less aware of time. And then all your actions and movements uh, just kind of follow from one thing to another and he talks about it like playing jazz. So it's like this improvisation thing going on when you're in this state of flow. So uh, Mahai was very interested in happiness and uh, what makes people happy 
and uh, you know how to uh, live a good life. So the question that he posed through his research was this one right here, which is what makes life worth living? Well, you know, he's done tons of research uh, into this, and he was really one of the first researchers who reported that from his studies and interviews with uh, people, that happiness in life does not really increase with acquiring more stuff beyond your ability to meet your basic needs. So, you know, capitalism works up to a certain point, but then there's this law of diminishing returns. The more that you acquire, it doesn't necessarily translate into increases in your happiness. So uh, that was an important finding that he came up with. And what he found when he dug deeper and he started looking at creative people, musical composers, artists, scientists, for example, and that what they had in common is they all reported that they were deeply engaged in meaningful activity, which was meaningful for them. And they weren't really doing it for fame. They weren't really doing it for material gain, but simply because they found it meaningful and worth doing. So that's very much an individual thing, right? Uh, they, they went into this field of study and they just got better and better at it. And that was their impetus for continuing and honing their skills and all of that kind of stuff. And from there, uh, from developing that, they, they were able to get into these flow states. So over the period of their careers, uh, they really accumulated you know, lots of states of flow. Uh, which they could then fall back on and use. Um, and also when they were in a state of flow, they also reported that they were immersed in the activity, just like he says on the quote, um, and that they were fully engaged and kind of in the zone as they were. And their attention was there and it was not on the next thing that needed to do. And they really kind of described the activity almost as doing them. They were in the activity and the activity was happening and some even use the word ecstasy to describe this state, this feeling that was generated from being in this state of flow. Now, the other thing worth mentioning uh, is that they had already spent a really a great deal of time already honing their craft, okay, Bef and getting their skills down. So it really is a combination of challenge and skill that sets up conditions for a flow state to develop in the first place you got to have something to bring to that table first. Uh, it's really tough to be in a flow state when you're, begin when you're learning something in the middle of learning something because there's just way too many variables that you're having to negotiate. But once you got that down, once you got your gig down, uh, then moving into that flow state and that meaningful flow state becomes much more of a possibility. Uh, so, uh, you know, really what we're talking about here is the challenge and the skill that is set up and then that then leads to you being able to develop the flow state. So it's not really being in the flow state for the state of being in the flow. That really wasn't what they were pursuing. That really, that was the byproduct of them engaging in the activity. It's this really the state of moving and from my perspective to simplify it, the state of moving towards something or someone that's important to you that sets up the conditions so you can generate the flow state. And the same is also true of many athletes who uh, report also of being in the zone, as they call it, uh, where time seems to stand still. And they are then so engrossed in the activity, whether they're in, in basketball or golf or tennis or whatever, uh, that what's going on around them becomes peripheral and they are really just what they call in the moment. So these are all um, ways of describing the flow state. So let me just kind of summarize what the research tells us. The research tells us a lot, and obviously we're using a lot of language here, but we're gonna get to some simplification here in a bit. So here's what the research says, and I'm just gonna summarize it here. First, you gotta develop your skills. You gotta have something to bring to the table, okay, great. So number two is you then select an interesting problem or a challenge. So it could be winning a tennis match. It could be writing a, a novel. It could be engaging in some type of important meeting. And then you have a goal or an end in mind. And it's more like a visualizing. It's more like an image, a picture that you have in your head. 
and you kind of frame up that experience and then you begin. And then the rest of it is about moving in the direction of that particular um, activity and then uh, noticing if that flow state so shows up. So these people that are really, really good at it, uh, they've had lots of practice with it so they can get into that flow state pretty quickly. Uh, the rest of us have to work at it a bit. So we're gonna get into that in just a little bit about how we can use them cells up for that flow state. So uh, let's just get into that. So getting to flow with the matrix is really what this is all about. So the challenge before us then is really uh, how to put this kind of flow into our everyday lives. Because what the research tells us is that the more we can have flow going on for us, uh, the happier and the more satisfied we're gonna be. And then I think that's something that we all wanna have and we want to have that kind of tucked into the back of our heads as we go about our day if we're really trying to move toward generating these flow states for ourselves. And, you know, there are a lot of moving parts here when you get back to this particular, you know, all this stuff we got to do. Uh, so uh, I'm an Act Matrix guy, and the Act Matrix is all about simplification uh, with less words. So let's see if we can do this with less words and point at flow and then, you know, keep it simple. So uh, I say we can really look at the process of the matrix and over years of using the matrix, both with others and myself. Uh, and, and really this is kind of what Kevin and I are up to with the art of being with the Act Matrix podcast. For those of you that don't know about it, we have a podcast, it's on SoundCloud, iTunes, being with the act matrix and I get on and we'll either chat about interesting subjects ourselves or we'll have special guests on to talk about whatever their area of expertise is how they're using the matrix and uh, you know we've been talking about how the matrix helps you to set up these flow states and then also how it can help you return to the flow states when you're not in them so uh, I think that getting to flow is really really, really about your original learning going. And this is really the learning that you use to learn language in the first place. Uh, before there was language, we had just pure experiencing. We we're born into the world, right? We're all just beings born into the world. And we then learn things and we learn language the same way we learn riding a bike and learning how to walk and learning how to talk. We learn it through our experience. So what we're talking about here, and I think what the flow state is really pointing toward, is this idea of experiential learning. So not so much words, but experiences. And the matrix really is uh, at heart a visual diagram, right? So let's get that up. So there's our matrix. I made a little different one today. And uh, it's really a visual diagram or a representation of how we learn. And it can also be used as a visual representation of how to generate and get into these flow states. And it actually contains the flow aspect of what we're aiming at as well. And I'll show you how that works. So here we are, and here's our matrix diagram to help us set the context for flow experiences. And it's gonna start up here with the five senses. This is where the learning begins. And we are naturally built to take in that information, as I said, and we take it in and all that information is just flowing down inside of us. It just flows and flows and flows all day long. We cannot stop the flow of that stimuli. It's gonna keep coming at us. There's just no two ways about it. But fortunately, we're also built to be able to respond and kind of filter out in any one time all that information and just be able to respond to a limited, a very limited amount of information. So once this information flows in, we're gonna generate responses down here, right? And then those responses are gonna flow back out, okay? Back up and out. And then as we act on our responses, as these responses come up out of the mind and get into the land of action, because obviously everything down here is the stuff of the mind, anything above this horizontal line, uh, or the things we're doing to move toward that sense of satisfaction in life, or the things we're doing to seek relief from that yucky stuff that might be showing up inside of us. So we're generating these responses, and then we wanna be able to notice 
the effects of the responses or the consequences of what we just did. So uh, that's really what this diagram right here, this vertical line is all about so that we can see where our actions are leading us over time. And then over time, we learn what works and we learn what doesn't work to uh, you know, help us move things along and get better at offering up behaviors to help us move forward. Now, as long as this flow here is able to naturally travel back and forth, we're good to go. And we could even get into that flow state that we talked about. But of course, things are never that easy. That's because along for the ride, we have a language-based mind. Unlike the animals and other critters in nature, we have this language-based mind. And that language-based mind down here is always, always, always generating thoughts. And it's always, always, always working to solve problems. And it will even present problems to itself to solve when it gets bored and has nothing else to do. So what we're up against really is how to deal with what's getting generated down here. Uh, because the natural flow state is where we are in the moment here. This is the present moment right here. What's going on outside of us. What's going on inside of us. And then responding in that state. Uh, and then what our minds are up to down here uh, is, uh, becomes less important. So in other words, flow is all about what's going on here along the vertical line. Now there are probably lots of ways to use a matrix to find and get into flow state, just as there's lots of other ways to get into a flow state. But you know, what the matrix has going for it that it naturally generates is something that we call psychological flexibility, right? So let's bring that up there, right? So the matrix is all about psychological flexibility as all, as, as all of acceptance and commitment therapy and training. And being psychologically flexible, when we're in that psychologically flexible state of noticing what's working, noticing what's not working, being able to move toward what's who and what's important to us in the presence of uncomfortable thoughts and feelings and urges, well, that feels pretty good. That feels pretty satisfying. And then we want more of that too. So it's inherent that it, it really helps to generate and get in and generate that flow state. And we can very easily set ourselves and others up for psychological flexibility by simply just drawing the matrix. Once we know about it, we can draw it out and then we can do what we call a loop around the matrix if we want to. We can take it even one step further. So it's a great way to flex yourself up and set yourself up for flow and what you want to be doing next. And this is also the matrix increases creativity when we are going and doing this loop. And right now I've got the, uh, the group matrix up, but we could certainly switch that over to uh, who and what's important to us. Uh, so right now, if you or I are on this podcast together or webinar together, uh, we could be noticing what's our shared purpose, right? And we could be talking about that. And then we can talk about what shows up and gets in the way, what yucky stuff shows up and gets in the way. Same for who and what's important to us. And then we could be like identifying obstacles, external obstacles, like things that we do to move away from that yucky stuff down there. And also we can be talking about things that we can do to move toward, you know, the shared purposes as well as who and what is important to us. But the idea is you're going through this loop is going to increase your psychological flexibility, my psychological flexibility, get us ready for whatever it is that we want to do next. So the matrix is a great way to get you into that, to get you ready to get into a flow state. So if we've just done a quick loop like that, then, you know, once we've established that, the thing that we're really doing now, let me just see if I can bring that up, is we now, and now I'm back to my original matrix diagram, we've just done that little loop. Uh, we've now established this idea of noticing. And noticing is just simply being aware. And being aware is a great way to keep flow going. As opposed to, uh, if we're not aware, if we're getting sucked up down here with this yucky stuff, well, you know, that's going to come up the works. So we've set up conditions for this noticing, which we are going to be using to go forward and be able to notice even further what's working to help us maintain the flow state. So once we've established that noticing, 
uh, and that psychological flexibility. Uh, in flow, really, as they talked about, things are really going to come to you. Uh, so, you know, basically, since it allows us, in my opinion, to gain perspective, and we're doing it with less words. Uh, and since we're not, you know, just, we're not training our minds here, we're able to benefit. It's not just the mind we're targeting, we're targeting the entire, all of us. Uh, so all of us now can get on board and be part of that process. And you know, I'm thinking of uh, one of the things that I regularly do is I'm a bit of a, a runner. I'm more of a jogger and a plotter than I am a runner. But one of the things that I'll do is I might be working on a project or something, could even be something like, like this webinar here. And what I'll do is I'll get up and I'll put on my running duds and I'll just have a little image in my head of where I would like to go with a project or something like this. And then I just go off and I begin to run. And I'm not really thinking about that project. I'm just really into the moment and the activity of the running. So I'm noticing myself as I'm turning the corner. I'm noticing the houses on the right and the left. I'm feeling my feet hitting the floor. I'm aware of my, uh, of my breathing. And as I go in, get into my run, uh, what will start to happen very often is things will come to me. Uh, a thought or an image will come up to me uh, that is directly related to that little bit of a mental image I put up there uh, at the very beginning of that run. So it's a way cool way to uh, set myself up. And you know, very often now when I'm running, uh, what's going to happen, uh, I get some really cool ideas. And they're coming from setting up those conditions, uh, you know, those matrix-like conditions where I'm getting into my five senses, I'm noticing what's showing up on my mind, I'm just aware of what's going on around me, and then I'm just going, I'm just heading out the door uh, without an, an agenda mod other than, well, I'm going to run for, you know, I don't know, 20 minutes or something like that and come back. And then notice what I could notice along the way. And that really, really, really gets creativity going, at least for me. So there is an example uh, that, you know, of not making a conscious effort and at the same time setting up conditions for flow. So uh, let me now go to a different uh, aspect of this right now. I got another thing I want to share with you. We're going to stop sharing the um, slides. I want to show you something else that I have been working on. And now you should see pretty quickly, I'm hoping. Yes, all right, so now you should be seeing a diagram of uh, what I'm calling the flow matrix. And there it is, there's your flow matrix right there. So uh, playing around with this a bit and chatting with Kevin. And so the idea with the flow matrix is that you would in fact pick your destination or whatever it is that you hope to accomplish, right? Kind of have that in mind a little bit. And then the first thing you want to do is you want to notice what's showing up in your five senses, wherever you're at, right? And then once you, you know, you kind of look around and you take a breath and you maybe feel something, uh, just get yourself a little bit grounded. And now the next thing you're going to do is you want to notice what's going on uh, down here, what your mind may be up to down here in the bottom, right? And your mind's probably going to be up to something. And since we can't eliminate the mind, we're going to just simply add this way cool thing that we talk about in the middle here of noticing. We're going to be noticing what our mind is up to, which is really accepting that we got one, that it's along for the ride, uh, and that, you know, it, we don't have to give it any more due than the fact that it is along for the ride right now. And we're accepting that we have, you know, that may contribute to something, it may not. And it, it could also be generating uh, wanted or unwanted thoughts. Uh, you know, I'm thinking uh, we just had a friend of ours, uh, Bill Carolyn, who was uh, on a podcast and he uh, is the monkey matrix guy. So if you get a chance, um, you uh, should check out the monkey matrix podcast because it's way cool. And uh, Bill is a, a way cool guy working in schools with kids. And um, he also was kind enough to share with us, uh, he created a song and got a nice voice. 
a nice little uh, lyrics going on there. And the song is called uh, Watching the Monkeys. And he talks about the stuff that's going on in your mind as the monkeys that show up. And monkeys are playful little critters. And they can be monkeys that lead us toward, right? They can be also monkeys that are mischievous and lead us away. Um, so either one can pull us off of our game. So the song is all about just simply watching the monkeys. So you don't mess with them or don't dance with them. We can just simply watch the monkeys. So that's kind of, you know, a uh, little homage to Bill there, if he's a part of this, if you signed up for this. And uh, hopefully in another couple of podcasts, he's given us permission to actually play the song. So you'll hear that down the road. And I'll let you know about that in an email. So anyhow, we're just simply uh, noticing as we uh, are looking to get ourselves into flow. So uh, now remember that uh, this noticing, this flow, as we talked about before, it's gonna require some effort, right? So there is this thing called effort showing up here, right? Because we're trying to move towards something here, right? This whole flow thing is not just about being in the state of flow, it's about we're flowing towards something. Just like water has a destination, it's going somewhere, right? And we are engaging in activities that are important to us. So, you know, the more meaningful the activity, probably the higher pro the probability is that we're going to get into flow. Uh, that's not to say that we couldn't get into flow with something that's a little less interesting, a little less exciting, but no, nonetheless important for us to be doing. Uh, so, you know, if we look at it, let's just look at the idea of baseball, you know, so in baseball, you know, well, what do you got? What are you looking at with your five senses? Well, what, what is going on in baseball? Well, there is a baseball. So we are noticing the baseball. You can just notice the ball. Uh, I remember years ago um, in Saturday Night Live, there was a character, Garrett Morris, and he played this baseball player. Uh, his name was called uh, Chico Escuela. And he would say, be the ball. He would hold the be the ball, right? So it's the idea of like, you notice the ball, you notice the seams on the ball. What's this all ball all about? And, you know, can you notice what this, what's going on with this baseball? Uh, same thing about a tennis ball, same thing about a football, or a golf ball, any kind of, round object, anything you're playing with, just simply notice, take it in with your five senses, well, at least with your four senses anyhow. And you go out noticing more stuff that's showing up about that ball. And then you can also be noticing what, what you're noticing about that ball up here in your five senses versus what your mind is up to, uh, to use Bill's term, what those monkeys are clucking about down there at the bottom. Uh, we can look at something like writing or playing an instrument, same thing. What are you using to play with? What are you using to write with? What is that like? What is it you want to express in your playing or your writing? And it can also be something like having an important meeting. Uh, what's going on around you? Uh, who's there? Do you notice the person, what the people are wearing? Uh, how do they sound to you? So staying close to this vertical line right here is really the key about getting yourself into a flow state and helping yourself generate that getting in and immersing yourself in that particular activity, okay? So uh, just keeping that vertical line in mind, one of the uh, matrix hacks here would be just keep that vertical line in mind and practicing that over time in different situations along the way, and that's really gonna help you to get into a flow. And now there's also something uh, that is looking to do, uh, you know, there's also something along for the ride and that would be your mind down there. And that is really what is going to be the thing that takes you out of flow. So uh, that's where the come into the, uh, well, gee, where did my flow go? I was in the flow and now I'm out of flow. What happened here, right? Well, so let me just bring up my next diagram, right? And now, and this is coming from, uh, uh, my conversations with Kevin, and we have been talking about this a bit, and you may even uh, see some of this and hear some of this in the podcast. But what I've added here is um, something that um, we, uh, I would call that uh, fight or flight stuff or free stuff that shows up that, what I would say, blocks the flow, right? So now we have a matrix, and now I've added uh, the amygdala. 
And the amygdala is like that almond sized little um, part of our brain. Actually, it's on it's bilateral, it's on both sides. And the idea is we have sensory information coming in and it's coming in through the amygdala right there, right? It's coming in, coming down through that amygdala, right? And then the amygdala is also connected up with all the other areas of our brain that uh, are processing that sensory information. So it's going back and forth. It's kind of a switching station, you know? So uh, the rest of that info is getting passed on down to, and it ends up down here at the bottom in what we call the prefrontal cortex. And that's that last little bit of your brain that pops out right up there in the front. And uh, that's what separates us from the rest of the pack because that's where all of our executive functioning is, and decision making and problem solving and planning and organizing, all that stuff is taking place all the way up to the tippy top here, right? So the problem with the flow uh, and the prefrontal cortex is the prefrontal cortex can feed information back into the amygdala as well. So the amygdala is there, it's kind of like our threat detection system, right? It's like the, the lifeguard patrolling the beaches. It's there looking for friend or foe, the information is just something that needs to be doing something about. And then it immediately sends us into a certain modes long before that prefrontal cortex gets involved. Not only like an hour later, but the amygdala responds first and then the prefrontal cortex shows up, what I would say, late to the party, right? So it wants to think it's in charge, but it really ain't in charge. The amygdala really is driving the bus here when it comes to most of this stuff. So uh, it's responsible for detecting threats and for keeping, keeping us doing things to stay alive. And then, uh, you know, it can also be, um, you know, the thing that gets in the way of the flow. So flow is also about letting that amygdala stand down so it can learn that what's going on is okay, especially if you're in a new or challenging situation because challenge can be scary. A challenge can fire up the amygdala a little bit, uh, especially if things don't necessarily go the way you want them to in the beginning. So what we want to do is work on that noticing, right? That's where the noticing comes into play. So we can help that amygdala uh, notice that things are okay. Um, and flow is about that whole idea of it's okay to go on and learn and be in this flow state. And we want to do it really and truly without a lot of words and instruction because the words and instruction are going to be coming down here. They're coming from this prefrontal cortex that's now shooting stuff back up to the amygdala and it can be shooting up, uh, danger signals to the amygdala too, uh, you know, thoughts and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not doing well or uh, I'm crappy or something like that. So that, that hits the amygdala. And now we have the alarm bells going off and all of that is really going to start blocking that flow. So we want that flow to go back and forth. We don't want it getting blocked up because that's what pops us out of flow, right? So there we have it. Uh, so uh, this is when we are out of flow, right? And then we're not paying attention. Uh, to the stories, instead of, uh, you know, going with the flow, we're going to let that amygdala just do its thing. Uh, words here will not add to the performance, right? Words are really just going to block the flow when it comes to this sort of thing. And I'm going back to the Dallas, right? The Dallas knew that the way was not something that could be walk, talked about. It was something that had to be experienced. So let me just see here now. I want to see if anybody is weighed in with any conversations. Well, you know what? Let's just see. Maybe somebody has. We're going to go back to the, uh, well, right now I see. Nope. We're good. All right. So I'm going to keep going. All right. So uh, what Kevin and I have been talking about then is about setting up this little mantra here that will help you stay in flow and also notice, help you notice when you're out of flow. Because if you're out of flow, guess what folks? No problem, right? All you gotta do is just notice that you are not in flow. And then you got a choice, right? Once you start noticing that, well, okay. Now what we wanna do is, you know, what we just said we could do is we could just bring this right back down to going right back up through the senses here, right? So again, the mantra 
the way to think about this, the way to kind of visualize it. I just had the vertical line now. I've dropped off the horizontal line. So the first thing, visual or mental image of where you are heading, where you want to go. End in mind, whatever way you want to put it. So now you want to next notice the five senses, right? Notice what's coming in, right? Now we've added this little bit about the amygdala. Well, you know, we can notice what the amygdala is up to, right? Is it sending us any, uh, you know, mayday kind of signals, right? And then we could also be down here noticing what that prefrontal cortex is up to. And then we can simply take a breath and begin right back up here, right? Or begin again, whatever the case may be, right? or continue. So it's notice five senses. Notice what your amygdala is up to. Notice what those monkeys are up to down there, right? And take a breath and begin. And repeating that. And the key to all of this stuff is that these are skills that you have to practice, that you build. Um, it's not just this idea of, you know, that you can just make it happen the first time or the second time. No, 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 no. It's not that easy go back to the research. You know, we, they looked at people that were, had done this quite a while and they were looking back at their experiences. So that's what got them to the flow state is just this process here we're talking about, right? And what we're doing here, what I'm doing here today is trying to cut down to that vertical line to make it simple. And even to just have the image of that vertical line is going to help you to get into maintain, regain your flow in whatever it is that you're doing. So uh, that's what I wanted to cover today. And what I would like to leave you with is this great quote that I have uh, shared uh, very often with many people. And I go back to it again and again. And I think it actually speaks to uh, exactly what we're talking about here today. Uh, so uh, this is a quote by a woman by the name of Martha Graham, who was a world famous dancer. And uh, it's a famous quote. You may or may not have heard about it, but it speaks to flow. So uh, I'm just going to read it to you. There is a vitality, a life force, an energy, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and be lost. The world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how valuable, nor how it compares to other expressions. It is your business to keep the channel open. You do not have to believe in yourself or your work. You have to keep open and aware directly to the urges that activate you. Keep the channel open. So in my mind, that speaks directly to this vertical line. And this is what we're doing here. You're working to keep the channel open so that you can keep yourself in the flow of creating and moving toward uh, who and what's important to you. And uh, specifically, whatever that task is or whatever that challenge is that you set before you, a challenge is the thing that activates this because it gives you that pull toward it. And it also gives us this kind of anchor to be moving toward. So uh, that's it for today's webinar. And I thank you for checking in with me. And uh, I'll have another one next month. And we will see you then. Have a good evening. Oh, uh, before I jumped off, I see, oh, uh, yeah. Bill did jump on. You are welcome, Bill. Hope you can listen to the recording. And uh, I am writing back now to uh, Bill Carroll when he was going to get on tonight. And he is the... Uh, He's the dude who wrote the Monkey Matrix song, so it was pretty cool that uh, too bad he got on late. <laughs>
I would have probably had him chat a little bit about that. But you know what? Maybe I can get him on here uh, sometime in the near future. And uh, we will uh, see you down the road. So uh, take it easy. Hi, Bill.